the two things that worry me now is one, I think you'll see much bigger numbers uh, of in, you know pro-Palestinians coming on Saturday because of the Home Secretary's uh, uh, noise over the last few days. But second, we also now know, and this is the really worrying thing, uh, that there's going to be uh, the English Defence League and others from the far right turning up on Saturday on Armistice uh, Day. They say, because they want to, in inverted commas, protect the Senate half, uh, and that's generated because of what the Home Secretary has been saying, but also we're worried because they do encourage hatred uh, and anti-Islamic sentiment. And so we are concerned uh, about those things happening Saturday and they're happening as a direct consequence of the Home Secretary and the Prime Minister. Do you have full confidence in the Home Secretary in the way the Prime Minister does? <laughs> uh, no. Uh, I mean, her behaviour over the last few days uh, and then, you know, the cherry on top is the article in the Times today uh, is, has been one that's irresponsible. It's uh, on many occasions incorrect and it's inflammatory at a time when I think, you know, politicians, whether you're the Home Sec, the Prime Minister or the Mayor, should be bringing communities together, uniting communities, and she's instead chosen to stoke divisions and divide communities is astonishing. Uh, I'm here at a school in North London where we're, we're working on a project that we funded uh, with Maccabi GB uh, and many others like the CST and Tell Mama giving our young people the tools, the confidence and the skills to deal with really difficult things, trying to remind them what we've got in common. Instead, uh, you've got a Home Secretary dividing communities and stoking divisions. The idea that hundreds of thousands of people who all turn up to express their views are on a hate march when a small minority misbehave is, you know, just uh, astonishing. It has been suggested by some people that actually as a result of putting so much spotlight on this march, and the inflammatory language the Home Secretary has been using, does she risk actually increasing the possibility that we do see trouble on the streets of London this weekend? Well, it's really important to reassure your listeners uh, that actually the law we have in place around protests has been around for almost 40 years, the Public Order Act 1986. Uh, you know, Mrs Thatcher, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, David Cameron, Theresa May, think about all the Prime Ministers over the last uh, 40 years and all, all the protests that have taken place on in one occasion has a commissioner thought there's enough evidence, intelligence, information that the threshold for serious disorder is reached. And he's then sought permission from the Home Secretary to ban a protest. The Home Secretary, by the way, was Theresa May in 2011. So the commissioner, his team are on top of the intelligence information. There's no evidence of serious disorder. The organizers themselves volunteered to move well away from the Senate half. There are restrictions in place if they come near the Senate half uh, that breaches the restrictions. The two things that worry me now is one, I think you'll see much bigger numbers uh, of in, you know, pro-Palestinians coming on Saturday because of the Home Secretary's uh, uh, noise over the last few days. But second, we also now know, and this is the really worrying thing, uh, that there's going to be uh, the English Defence League and others from the far right turning up on Saturday on Armistice uh, Day. They say because they want to, in inverted commas, protect the Senate half, uh, and that's generated because of what the Home Secretary has been saying. But also we're worried because they do encourage hatred uh, and anti-Islamic sentiment. And so we are concerned uh, about those things happening Saturday, and they're happening as a direct consequence of the Home Secretary and the Prime Minister. Um, uh, we'll, we'll persevere today. I think lots of people must be messaging you to tell you that they, you're on Times Radio, which is why we can, we can hear, the, hear the phone picking. Um, I just want to draw... I, I take, you know, lots of people will, will be listening to you and your, your criticism of, of Sir Alan Brafman. Clearly, you know, it's the Home Secretary's job to hold the Met to account, just as it is yours as Mayor of London. And you have done that before, when you were so critical of Cressida Dick uh, as the commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, that she had to resign. The 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 police watchdog said she felt intimidated to quit, quit quitting and was effectively constructively dismissed. So you, in a political role, uh, and based on what you said, did change the way that the policing happened on the streets of London. So why, why just because you disagree with her, why is Swella Barfman wrong to make these criticisms of, of policing? Yes, a really important point you raise, and I, I, I deal with your point, because it's more to distinguish oversight and scrutiny with trying to interfere with operational uh, matters. What the Home Secretary is trying to do, I, I never sought to do, is interfere with operational matters, particularly in a public uh, way. So what she has sought to do is to persuade the police to ban the march. That would be acting unlawfully because there isn't evidence there that serious disorder would occur. That's the test in the 1986 Public Order 
act. But then secondly, she's used a public forum, whether it's the Times or whatever, to articulate those views. I've had many conversations with this commissioner, the last commissioner, and indeed the one before her. And they're private conversations. You ask for assurances, you ask for information, you make representations, and then you allow the police to act based upon their operational expertise. And it's incredibly important to understand what the Home Secretary and our Prime Minister are seeking to do. They're seeking to put pressure on the police to ban the march. Now, just think this through. If today we're allowing our Home Secretary to go unchallenged in putting pressure on the police to ban a protest, what's to stop tomorrow her telling the police who to investigate, the day after who they should arrest? Next week she'll be telling the CPS who they should be uh, charging next month, the judges, who they should find uh, guilty. That is not the way we operate in this country. Have you spoken, Sola Bartman, this week about all of this? Uh, not for weeks. I, I wasn't invited to the meeting the Prime Minister had with the Commissioner when he summoned the Commissioner in uh, this week. The Home Secretary has not been in touch with me to express any concerns in relation to the, the forthcoming Saturday and previous Saturdays. Saturdays. And by the way, uh, Matt, over the course of the last seven years, I've worked really closely with Conservative Home Secretaries, really closely with Conservative uh, Prime Ministers. We've had massive events over the last uh, seven and a half years from terrorist attacks to the Grenfell Tower, to the pandemic, uh, to uh, Her Late Majesty passing away. We're working together. It's conducive uh, to the good of our city and our country. This is a time, surely, when we should be working closely together. I'm disappointed that rather than the Home Secretary and the Prime Minister bringing communities together, bringing Muslim and Jewish Londoners together. You're working with me, working with the police. Instead, she's uh, for clearly naked political ambition, choosing a battle. And, and I worry about the consequence that leads to, but also look, these young people here today, we're educating them about stereotypes, uh, about making super generalizations. And lo and behold, on the, on the front page of today's Times, one of the great offices of state is doing just that, reinforcing stereotypes, making generalizations about a hate march. Um, just finally, on the on the the, the more substantial uh, issue of what is happening in Israel and Gaza right now, it looks as if, well, certainly the the uh, amendments being put down to the King's speech, there may well be a vote uh, in the Commons on calling for a ceasefire. You were obviously a Labour MP before. If you were in uh, the House of Commons right now, would you vote for a ceasefire, even if that meant you losing a front bench job? Well, I'm not in Parliament, thankfully. I, I don't make Labour policy. My views are quite clear in relation to uh, this. The point I make in a gentle way uh, to, 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 in relation to what Keir Starmer is doing is actually a lot of things Keir Starmer is saying and doing in relation to the Middle East, I agree with. Two-state uh, solution, ensuring that food, medicine, water gets into those Palestinians suffering in Gaza, making sure those hostages, more than 200 hostages, are, are released uh, immediately, working to make sure we can have a resolution of what's happening in uh Gaza. But listen, I'm somebody who's made my views quite clear. Unacceptable what Hamas did in relation to killing, killing uh, more than 1,400 people, taking hostage more than uh, uh, 200 terrorist organisation. I also think it's unacceptable what the Israeli military is doing. More than 10,000 lives lost as a consequence of them being killed. More than 4,000 children's lives being lost. I think international partners, I think uh, experts, diplomats, have got to get to a peaceful resolution. The way to get there is a ceasefire. So it, your message then to Keir, I'm sure you, have you spoken to Keir Starmer about this again since you, you went public with your call for a ceasefire? And your message to him, if, if Labour frontbenchers do vote for a ceasefire, are you, are you urging him to not sack them, to keep them in place? Keir and I speak regularly all the time. What we don't do is share the conversations that we have. I'm not going to start today.